We're waiting for the main attraction. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've proved one thing. You can get old. <laughs> okay. I get Jeez. my book open. Yes, sir. Yes, 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 yes. yes. All right. Are you ready? <clears throat> Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. The consecrate Till death does set me free And then go home to where I to wear For there's a crown for me Oh precious cross, oh glorious crown Oh resurrection down and where's my soul Amen. Thank you. I'd like to have you open your Bibles this morning to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to look at verse 14 of chapter 2 all the way down to verse 5 of chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and we'll begin reading here in just a moment. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time together, and thank you for the day that you've given us. Thank you for this time that we're able to spend in your word today. May it go forth with power and have clarity. Lord, help us to apply it as we seek to minister in this day and time. In Jesus' name, amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning at verse 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity and as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men, for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not in, with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. When I was 17, I moved away from home to attend college. And after my first year in college, I remained in the city. I had become good friends with a young man, and he and I uh, got an apartment together and with a couple of other guys. And uh, my good friend uh, was, how can I say this? a good-looking guy, and he had a girlfriend, 
And the girlfriend got us to start attending a church there in that area. I got to know the minister there in that church. Um, he was uh, I, an older man at that time. He was probably around 70. I'm guessing he and his wife uh, were in their, probably in their 70s. They had raised their children, their two daughters. And uh, I had gone to him and I had asked him some advice about some things, just normal things of life. You know, I was kind of stressed about school and work, and I was kind of, you know, struggling with some things. One evening, he and his wife came over, and they had just bought a little puppy. They came over to my apartment. I was there by myself that night, and... Uh, that little puppy left me a present on the patio. I, I still remember that, of all things. But uh, the, the minister was just conversing with me, and he said, he said to me, Gary, I have a question for you. And I said, okay, what is it? He said, well, you know, in light of the things that you've said to me, he said, I, I just want to know, have you ever considered going to see a psychiatrist? <laughs> I, at the time, I, I knew the things that I had told him were no big deal. I mean, it's something everybody goes through at some level, at some time, in some way. You know, we're all stressed. We're all anxious about things. Then he said this to me. He said, my daughter has gone to a psychiatrist for years, and it's really helped her. I am not exaggerating when I say this. I knew his daughter. She was a basket case. <laughs> And my first thought when he's telling me this is I thought, my word, he really hates me. <laughs> he wants me to be like his daughter. <laughs> Obviously, I, I never went. Um, <laughs> because I, <laughs> that really didn't come out right. <laughs> So, so a couple of years later, I, uh, I went, I, st I got saved, and uh, I started going to a church, and I met with this other pastor, and as I was talking with him, everything I asked him, everything he said to me, he opened the Bible, and he gave me answers from the Bible. And I thought, what a contrast between the two. And I, I still remember one of the things he said to me at that, during that conversation. I don't knew, he said this, I don't know about you, friend Gary. He called me friend Gary. He was not a Quaker. I don't know about you, friend Gary, but I want to get on the Lord's bandwagon and I want to enjoy the life that he's given me in this world, in this present time, as much as I possibly can. And I want to, you know, basically what he was saying was, I want to live my life in accord with what God has revealed in his word. To show you, the, some year, a couple of years later, I went to the same pastor one time, and I was complaining about my job. I, I had a, a job, I was working nights, and I had a job, uh, and I was just, I was complaining about it. He just looked at me, and he said, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. And my response was, you don't understand. My situation is this. And he looked at me, and he said, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I said rejoice. I know that, I know that, but... And he just kept saying that. He kept repeating Paul's statement to the Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, he was that kind of pastor. He was that kind of minister. You know, a couple of things 
have driv been driven home to me the last year, the last few years, over the years, I should say. We can view life from a humanistic, temporal perspective, or we can view it from God's perspective. We can, view, we can view ministry from a temporal, earthly perspective. And that's where most churches are. And that's where most ministers are. They view everything as centered around the here and now and not with eternity in view. And not with God in view. God, as, as the Bible says, God is not at all in their thoughts. He doesn't matter to them. A couple of things have been driven home to me this past year. The importance and the urgency and the clarity of the gospel, the necessity of it. I, I don't know how much longer we have. Only God does. But from the things that I see happening and the things that I read in God's word, and that's the most important thing, not my, my perception of things, what I see in God's word, the gospel message is very, very, very urgent. And it's very clear. Jesus Christ died to pay the penalty for sin. Jesus Christ shed his blood on, the Cal on Calvary's cross to forgive us our sins and to reconcile us, to give us hope. That's one thing that just... You read First and First Corinthians. You read Second Corinthians. You read Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Read all of Paul's letters. That is one thing that drove Paul. You know, it was the gospel. I want people to know the gospel. I want people to understand the importance of the gospel. The other thing is this. The necessity of ministry in and through the local church has to be Bible-centered. It has to be. If we're not, if we're not all about the, the Bible at Grace Bible Church, we're in trouble. And that's where a lot of churches have, have gone up. You know, if you, if you uh, heard Pastor Matt in Sunday school this morning, he was talking about pragmatism. One of, the, one of the things he mentioned was, pragma he mentioned other things too, I didn't hear it, but he mentioned other things. No, I heard him. Something about perils. I kept getting mixed up between perils and pearls. I'm not sure which one. There are perils, and one of the big perils is pragmatism. And I'll never forget, somebody said, to, somebody said one time, you know what the problem with pragmatism is? It works. It works. So if, 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 if it works, it must be right. That's the wrong perspective. As he mentioned in Sunday school, our duty is not success or happiness. It's faithfulness to God. Faithfulness to what the scriptures teach. You know, Paul had a lot of enemies in his life and ministry. And it's easy, the easy thing to do is, is to criticize somebody for uh, their ministry. There are things about Paul's ministry that just really are critically important to understand. One of the things, the reason Paul ministered the way he did was because he was so concerned about God's glory. God was everything to Paul. And God's glory was everything to Paul. God wanted, or Paul wanted God to be glorified in everything. In everything he did. In every way he ministered. He sought the glory of God. Remember what he said to the Corinthians in the first letter? Whether you eat or drink or whatsoever things you do, do all to the glory of God. Everything is about the glory of God, not the glory of man. 
Paul didn't care one iota about himself. He wanted God to be glorified, God to be magnified, God to be honored in everything that he said that he did. It it was all about God's glory. But he was also concerned about God's truth. You know, I I have a, a paper that someone gave me years ago and I've, I've been reading it over and over and over again in preparation for something. And I was just, I'm so impressed about truth because we're living in a day and time when there is no such thing as truth. It's not that truth doesn't matter. It's that people are telling us truth doesn't exist. It's not just unimportant. It's impossible to know the truth. And that's not at all what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches us that God is the God of truth. Jeremiah 10.10. That Jesus is the truth. John 14.6. That the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And the Bible itself is the word of truth. Truth matters. One, one person uh, I remember years ago doing a workshop, he mentioned this. Do you know the very antonym of truth, the very opposite of truth, is the devil? Jesus said about Satan, we, we learned this a few weeks ago in, in Sunday school. Uh, it, Jesus said about Satan, he is the father of lies. In fact, he was... From the beginning, from the beginning of creation, from from the beginning of man and woman, he was the very antithesis of truth. And when he speaks, it's a lie. Remember what he said to Eve? You will not surely die. And that was a lie. Truth is very, very, very important. It was was important to Paul. He was was passionate about truth. He was also passionate about the holiness of God. The holiness of God is essential. I mean, you can't read, and, and we talked about this a little bit last week, you can't read Scripture without understanding how holy God really is. Remember, the, the last week I talked about this, the prayer of Hannah in second, or 1 Samuel chapter 2. Hannah, in her prayer, says, There is no one holy like the Lord. I mean, here is a Jewish maiden, a Jewish woman, who understood the holiness of God. That God is absolutely holy is essential. And then the final thing, God's love. And one one friend of mine puts it this way, that God's love is the lubricant that drives His glory, His truth, and His holiness. God is a God of love. God is love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God loves us. Christ loves us. Christ loved me and gave himself for me. Why do these things matter? Why are they important? And how does this fit in to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, because of all the criticisms that Paul faced. Remember these? We talked about them last time or a couple of weeks ago. He's not come back to Corinth, so he's not faithful to his word. He told us he'd come back, but he hasn't come back. And, and I showed you on the map where all this was, where he was when he wrote these letters and where he had to travel, how he had to get there. He had to cross the, the seas there, the Aegean Sea and, and so on, to get to Corinth and, and to walk on foot. It wasn't like he was able just to hop in a, a, 
a car and, and go somewhere. <laughs> I don't know if you heard this. I, I saw this. Someone put out a Twitter thing yesterday or last week. You, you've all heard about the, the gas crisis that we're facing, or not necessarily in certain parts of the country. A guy uh, had a Prius last week, and he, he said, uh, hey, just a heads up, don't put diesel in your Prius. <laughs> I, I read this to my wife last night, and we just laughed. Don't put diesel in your Prius. I thought there's no difference between gasoline and diesel, and it would just make my car knock louder. My car doesn't run. I've called AAA and I'm waiting for it to be towed. Don't put diesel in your Prius. <laughs> and these people vote. <laughs> I'm just saying. But it wasn't like he was able to get in his car and just drive. He had miles, thousands of miles to travel. He's not, he's not eloquent. He lacks oratory skills. We talked about this. He's physically unimpressive. You get what you pay for. You remember I, I said this is, this is something that he had, uh, that in that day, in that time, that they, they judged preachers or they judged speakers by the amount of money that they charged, by the amount of money that they were given. And then finally... He's a jailbird. He's been in prison. You can't trust somebody like that. He's not, he's not reliable. These criticisms were the content the con of the conduct of his ministry. They were not of the content of his message. And, and I want us to see this. Uh, there are a number of chapters, a number of passages I have down, but I, I just the whole thing, the whole thing about this is this. Paul is accused of ministering in the flesh. And, and his answer is, yes, I do minister in the flesh, but not according to the flesh. My ministry is a spiritual kind of ministry. And, and now in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in chapter 2, he's going to tell us, he's going to explain to us what this spiritual kind of ministry is. He says, first of all, in verse 14, now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. That first part of, of verse 14 it's like he's being led, or he's talking about being led into a victorious procession. And I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago when, when uh, Babylon captured Judah and took them away. Nebuchadnezzar had a procession going through uh, the, the realm into Babylon. I remember years ago I, I was... Uh, I was able to go to uh, the University of Chicago Museum in, in downtown Chicago, and they had, uh, they had displays on there from Egypt, artifacts from Egypt, and artifacts from Babylon. And one of the artifacts they had was a huge piece, an arch of the Ishtar Gate in Babylon. And I remember standing there looking at that, and there, there were little tiles. There were little blue tiles, and they had the lions on them, and it, you know, it was just it was just gorgeous. And I remember thinking, Daniel the prophet saw this. Daniel walked through this gate as he entered the city of Babylon, and I'm standing here, little Gary looking at this magnificent gate. Well, Daniel was part of that procession that, that was led through the gate. Or another option, too, is that Paul may have been referring to a Roman procession. This was interesting to me, a Roman procession. You know, after the Romans would, would be victorious, the army would be led by a general, 
And the general would have a, a procession. The general would dress up in, in magnificent attire, and he would get in a chariot that was pulled by four horses, and he, he would be decked out, and he'd have people all around. His family would be with him, and he would be led through the streets of Rome to all this, this uh, beautiful uh, display. It's like, a, like a, a big parade that we have, uh, you know, sometimes, well, we used to until last year. But the, the, he would be surrounded by his officers, followed by his family, and the spoils of war would, would accompany him into, this, into, the, into the city of Rome. And they would go to a place, get this, they would go to a place in Rome called Circus Maximus. And when you hear that, Circus Maximus, what do we think? A circus. That's not what it was. <laughs> it was a big coliseum. It was a huge they, they estimate it could seat 150,000 people. And they, they would take everybody into this Circus Maximus, and they would take all the prisoners that had been captured by this general, they would take them all in there, and they'd kill them. In front of a hundred, that's, that's entertainment in Rome. They'd kill them. They'd either turn them over to beasts or have gladiators fight them or whatever. After, after uh, Paul's life, about 81, 80, 81, uh, they, they did something with the Circus Maximus. They built a huge arch in Cir at Circus Maximus, at one end of Circus Maximus, and they named it after the Roman general Titus. You know why they, they built it in honor of Titus? Because about 10 years earlier, Titus, as a Roman general, had destroyed Jerusalem. And he slaughtered, he slaughtered thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews. And by the way, in order to receive this parade, in order to be honored this way, the general had to have had killed 5,000 enemy in battle. And Paul says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph, notice this, in Christ. See, we're not in this triumphal parade yet. <laughs> that awaits the future. But Paul is writing about it as if it's true then. It's sure then, one day we will be in this triumphal, and, and we will not be led to Circus Maximus. We will be led to a place that is far, far, far better. Heaven. And we do that because of the one who died and rose again for us. Notice he says, in Christ. He's not, he's not commending himself or talking about his accomplishments or their accomplishments. He's talking about what Christ, he's talking about. We do this because we are in Christ. He died and rose again. And what does that mean? Why is that important? Because we're assured of the ultimate victory. But right now, Folks, we have to realize this. We're in enemy territory. I hate to say it, but we are in enemy territory. And then he goes on in verses, the last part of verse 14 in, down to verse 16, and he, taught, he, he uses a second, a second illustration. We're an odor of death or life. Notice he says, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. You understand, because of Christ, we are well pleasing to God. It's not because we're such 
upstanding people. It's not because we're such wonderful people. He uses this illustration, this image of incense as he pictures the Christian ministry and he sees believers, he, he sees believers as a fragrance of Jesus Christ. To other believers, they're a fragrance of life. Notice, notice that he says, make it manifest a savor of his knowledge in every place. We are a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one, he says, we are the savor of death unto death. That is, to those who perish, we are a savor of death. Doesn't make any sense to them. The things, the things of God, the things of Christ, they're meaningless to them. And that's what he said earlier in, in the first letter he wrote. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, moronic. It doesn't make any sense. But to us which are saved, it, it's wonderful. I, I reconnected with a friend of mine. I hadn't talked to him for probably about 40 years. Uh, I, I had seen him once after we graduated from high school and uh, I hadn't, I, well, I guess I had talked to him when I was in Bible college, but uh, I, I talked to him a couple of weeks ago and I, I don't know where he is spiritually. I don't know if he, he is a believer. I know he's very conservative politically. I, I've, I get five or six email or five or six test, text messages from him every week now that he's got my phone number. <laughs> I hear this, I hear the thing go off, and I said, well, there's, there's another one from Scott. wonder what conspiracy he's wanting me to watch now. But anyway, I, I was talking to him about this, about the direction my life has gone. And I told him, I, I gave him my testimony in just very brief fashion. I said, you know, it was in 19, uh, 1982 in August, when I put my faith and trust in Christ, when God in his infinite grace and mercy saved me from my sin. And I was shocked by the answer he wrote back. It was just one word. Amen. And so I think, oh, you know, that was, that was really like telling Gary Sikkim, and I just wrote out some more stuff to him, and he wrote back some more. Amen. Amen. But other people have not responded positively. They don't respond that way. We're a saver to them, that per to them that perish, death unto death. To others, a, a savor of life unto life. Verse 16. And then he asks this question. It's interesting how he asks this question. Who is sufficient for these things? Now, let me give you the answer. Nobody. Nobody is sufficient. In and of ourselves. And that's the point he's trying to make. Nobody is sufficient for this. And he goes on in verse 17, for we are not as many, watch that, as many, see that? As many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, Speak we, here it is again, in Christ. Remember that back in verse 14? Who causes us to triumph in Christ? We speak in the sight of God. We speak in Christ. That's why I said God is everything to Paul. Everything. And, and it's all, it all centers about the fact that he and we are in Christ. And then in chapter 3, he starts off 
Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or do we need, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? And what's he saying here? All, all he's saying is, you know, some people, to get in places, sometimes you need the letter of recommendation. You need a letter of commendation. If you ever ask someone, hey, would you, I'm, I'm applying for this job. This used to be the way they used to do it back in the olden days. Not so much anymore because it's all online, I know. I'm behind the time, but so is Paul, okay? So he, he says, do we need letters of recommendation from you? Do we need to show you letters of recommendation from other people? Well, guess what? That's irrelevant. That's not the point. That won't get us anywhere. Because notice in verse 2, ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. That, that is powerful. I mean, you're the letter of recommendation. Your proof of our ministry, your proof of the validity of what I have said, of what I have preached, of the gospel that I, what God has done in your life is the evidence, the valid evidence that, that what I am saying is true. In verse 3, he says, For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. What's more important, a letter written in ink or a testimony of the, that the Spirit has worked in a person's heart and life? What's more impressive? I'm reminded of something in, in the Gospels. When Jesus started his ministry, his public ministry, when Jesus started that, he was on his own. And he does something that seems strange to us, but in that culture, it was necessary. It was expected. He started collecting disciples. He started surrounding himself with disciples. Now, we typically think of the 12, right? But there were more. More disciples followed him. Why is that so important? Because in that culture, in that day, disciples were the validation of a teacher's authenticity, were the validation of, of that person being a, can I say it, rabbi. If a person was a rabbi, it meant he had disciples. You couldn't just go out and say, well, I'm a rabbi, I'm a rabbi, and nobody's listening to you. And one of the things, one of the things that, that the disciples were responsible for doing was supporting the rabbi. And so they would go out, they would work during the day, they would do things during the day, and, and they, would, they would get money and they could, the rabbi could live off of that. I think it's, it's a parallel with this. That, that you are our epistles. You are our letters. Because the Spirit of God has written in your heart. And then he does, he says something interesting too. He says, verse, verse 3, not with, or excuse me, not in tables of stone. And that takes us back to Moses going up and getting the Ten Commandments and writing the Ten Commandments, or having the Ten Commandments written down in stone. The believers in Corinth were proofs of Paul's, the validity of Paul's ministry. In other words, it was the Spirit working in their hearts and lives. 
And such, verse 4, and such trust have we through Christ to God, to Godward. We trust God for this. Remember his question that he asked back in verse 15 of chapter 4? Who is sufficient for these things? In chapter 3, verse 5, he answers that, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of, as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is God. Or our sufficiency is of God. The believers in Corinth were proof of the validity of Paul's ministry. And the regeneration that they experienced was proof. It wasn't just, it wasn't just a, a superficial, temporal thing with Paul. It was spiritual. He was genuinely concerned about these lives of these people. I, I never cease to be amazed about ministry. Good Bible, te- that, that namely that good Bible teaching encourages, it edifies, it confronts, it convicts us. It's the teaching of sound doctrine that changes people's lives, and it gives the, the Spirit of God, the, the, can I say, the resources to make us the people of God that God wants us to be. God, the, the, you know the amazing thing? God takes any of us and uses any of us. That's the amazing thing. And the older I've gotten, the more I realize that's, that's truly remarkable. That God would take us and use us. When you stop and think about who God really is, God doesn't need any of us. But because He loves us, He uses us. He helps us. He teaches us. And God God does it so often... In spite of ourselves, <laughs> in spite of me, we're so undeserving of his working in us and through us. I don't think Paul, and you see this throughout Paul's letters, he never ever gets over the grace of God. We, we hear that all the time. He never got over the grace of God. He, he really didn't get over the grace of God. You know, he tells, he tells the Corinthians, by the grace of God, I am what I am. I'm sufficient because God made me. God working through me makes me sufficient. But it's God's sufficiency, not mine. We're such weak vessels. I mentioned earlier that I... Uh, I hadn't gone to see the psychiatrist. Yes, I'm still the cracked vessel or the cracked pot. (laughs) It's quite astounding that anyone is used of God at all. You know what's even more astounding? The great things that God does through us. He really does great things through all of us. I look back on life, and I, I just, I, I am so thankful to be here, to be with you, to know you. It is such a privilege and a joy. And I mean that. I, I'm not just saying it. I really mean it. And it's really special. We get, to, we get to celebrate a birthday today of someone very special who's also a cracked pot. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm kidding. It's all because of God. And that's Paul's point. It's all God doing this. Not us. It's him. And, and what God has done in Paul's life, he's going he's gonna to talk about this some more. We'll, we'll get into this more next week too. But he, he talks about the focus needs to be on God, not us. It's always about God. 
First, second, third, last. It's all about God. He's the sufficient one, not us. Who is sufficient for these things? God. God is. Bottom line, top line, middle line, God. Father, thank you for this time together this morning, and thank you for the day that you've given us and for the opportunity we've had to be together today. Use these things to encourage us and to embolden us in the work of the ministry that you've given us here. In Jesus' name, amen.